Hello, beloved. Welcome to my podcast study of the book of Titus, week two. Today we will cover chapter one. We'll do the we'll read the NIV, then the King James Version in detail. I also want to state before we go any further that last week I stated that the Ten Commandments is in Exodus chapter 18 when it's actually in Exodus chapter 20, just in case anyone's looking for it. So I stand corrected on that. I'm also going to be giving away another scriptural spiral notebook. I'm going to be giving that away to anyone who signs up here for the podcast. I'm going to be giving it away on the 15th. I'm going to announce the winner on the 15th, which will be the last podcast of this study, Lord's Will. So that's for everyone who signs up for the podcast. You can sign up. You can email me at terrytemple7 at gmail.com to sign up or in my group Terry Temple on Facebook. Just click on the events tab and you can sign up from there. And of course, it's all free. Praise the Lord. This is all free. It's priceless. God's word and studying his word is priceless, but it's free. God is good. God is good. Amen. God is good. So before we get started, let's go to God and word word of prayer right quick to ask for his guidance. Let's go to God in prayer. Holy Father God who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thank you, Lord, for this day. Thank you for your countless blessings in our life. Please forgive us of our sins and shortcomings. Forgive and bless greatly anyone who sinned against us. Purify our hearts. Give us a heart that's eager to love and forgive. Purify our heart. Humble our hearts. Use us for your glory. Please give me wisdom, Lord. Guide us in the direction of this study. Open our eyes, hearts, and ears to your word, to the truth. I pray that we accept it so we can do all things pleasing and acceptable in your sight. Bless everybody on the call who is grieving, going through hard times. Bless them with everything they need, with comfort, strength, and resources. Bless America and the church around the world, in, here in America as well. Just bless the church. Christians all over the world, especially the persecuted, tortured Christians, bless them, grant them safety and peace and comfort and strength and everything they need. And just guide us. Thank you for this lesson and everybody listening in. Thank you for blessing us. Please guide us. In Jesus' name, our Lord and Savior, we ask you and we thank you in advance. Amen. So last week I shared what the book of Titus is about. is to show the importance of and priority of training members to be leaders in the church. Unfortunately, this duty is lacking in the church or churches today. More focus needs to be on the building up of the kingdom instead of materialism, which is idolatry. So this study is indeed vital to the life of the church. And I want to thank the sisters that encouraged me to do a study here on the book of Titus. And so if you missed last week's podcast, I encourage you to go listen where I talk about how to rightly divide the word of God. And I also did a brief introduction on the book of Titus that tells us what it's about. And so I encourage you, if you missed last week's podcast, to listen to that. Okay, and so today we're going to be talking about Titus and Paul. Paul wrote the book of Titus. And so Paul was... He was originally a Pharisee. He was a persecutor of Christians. He was not one of the original 12 converts. He was converted on the road to Damascus by Jesus himself. He wrote most of the letters of the book in in the uh, New Testament. He wrote he wrote most of the books in the New Testament, not including the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. Okay, and so Titus, Titus was a Greek believer. He was one of Paul's companions. He was a student and Paul left him in Crete, which is, was an island near Jerusalem. He left him in Crete to appoint elders. And so that's what this letter is about. OK, so let's go read this right now. So we're going to start in the NIV. I'm reading from the parallel Bible is King James on one side and the NIV on the other side. And so we're going to start in the NIV. So chapter one, Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ to further the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness in the hope of eternal life, which God, who does not lie, promised before the beginning of time and which now at his appointed season, he has brought to light through the preaching entrusted to me by the command of God, our savior. 
verse 4, to Titus, my true son, in our common faith. Grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Savior. Verse 5, the NIV headline over that reads, appointing elders who love what is good. The reason I left you in Crete was that you might put in order what was left unfinished and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. An elder must be blameless, faithful to his wife, a man whose children believe and are not open to the charge of being wild and disobedient. Since an overseer manages God's household, he must be blameless, not overbearing, not quick tempered, not given to drunkenness, not violent, not pursuing dishonest gain. Rather, he must be hospitable, one who loves what is good, who is self-controlled, upright, holy and disciplined. Verse nine, he must hold firmly to the trustworthy message as it has been taught so that he can encourage others by sound doctrine and refute those who oppose it. Verse 10 headline over that reads rebuking those who fail to do good. For there are many rebellious people full of meaningless talk and deception, especially those of the circumcision group. They must be silenced. Because they are disrupting whole households by teaching things they ought not to teach. And that for the sake of dishonest gain. Verse 12. One of Crete's own prophets has said it. Cretans are always liars, evil brutes, lazy gluttons. This saying is true. Therefore rebuke them sharply so that they will be sound in the faith and will pay no attention to Jewish myths or to the or to the merely human commands of those who reject the truth. Verse 15. To the pure all things are pure, but to those who are corrupted and do not believe nothing is pure. In fact, both their minds and consciences are corrupted. They claim to know God, but by their actions they deny him. They are detestable, disobedient, and unfit for doing anything good. Hmm. So, okay, so now let's read the King James. King James, the epistle of Paul, the apostle to Titus. Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledging of the truth, which is after godliness in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. But half in due times manifested his word through preaching, which is committed unto me according to the commandment of God our Savior. To Titus, mine own son, after the common faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ our Savior. For this cause I left thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting, and ordain elders in every city as I had appointed thee. If any be blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of riot or unruly. For a bishop must be blameless as the steward of God, not self-willed, not soon angry, not given to wine, no striker, not given to filthy lucre. But a lover of hospitality, a lover of good, good men, sober, just, holy, temperate. Holding fast the faithful word as he have been taught that he may be able to sound may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision, verse 11, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole housings, houses, teaching things which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. One of themselves, even a prophet of their own, said the Christians are always liars, evil beasts, slow bellies. This witness is true. Wherefore, rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith, not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men that turn from the truth. Unto the pure, all things are pure, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure. But even their minds and consciences defile. They profess to know God. They profess that they know God, but in works they deny him, being abominable and disobedient and unto every good work reprobate that's deep Paul don't be playing he just be putting it out there <laughs> I believe this is one reason a lot of people don't like reading the Bible did you see how tough Paul was Paul don't be kidding around he just was really nailing it and uh that's a true man of God right there we don't hear a lot of speech like this in the church today you know we're in the last days 
So keep that in mind as we as you read the Bible. Just remember we're in the last days, especially when you come to the New Testament. Mankind has always been screwing up since the Garden of Eden, but now we're in the last days. And so the last days is things are just getting further and further away from the truth and further and further away from the uh, original, the way the church was in the book of Acts when the church began. It's just getting further and further away. And so it's hard to find congregations of God's people that's adhering to the word of God. It's just like you can find some, but there, I don't think there's a church exactly like the one in the book of Acts today. Uh, there's probably out there, but they hard to find. And so, so let's just try to keep that in mind as we read the word of God, but it doesn't mean that it's not possible. Everything that God, that God writes in here, it is possible or God wouldn't have wrote it. And so it's possible. So let's do the breakdown. So verse one. So we're going to compare a little bit the King James to the NIV. And so the King James all the way up to verse four, verses one through four. I don't see anything really different. However, I like the King James. The King James says in verse two, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie. The NIV says God doesn't lie. I prefer God cannot lie. Because there's a difference between a person that don't lie and cannot lie. And so a lot of people, I learned not too long ago, that a lot of people, even people that believe the Bible and that believe God exists, they don't believe everything in the Bible is true. But I'm here to tell you everything in the Bible is true. God cannot lie. Mankind did not write this Bible on their own. Everything you see here, these books or letters, these are was written by uh, men that were inspired by God. Not like today. Anyone can write a book today, even a devout Christian, but it doesn't mean they're inspired by God. They may have the guidance of the Holy Spirit, but it's not the same as when the apostles wrote these letters. It's not the same. OK, they don't, it's not on the same level. OK, and so I just want to put that out there that all of God's word can be trusted. The whole Bible, all of it is infallible. Every word from Genesis to Revelation, God's word can be trusted. All of it. OK, I read the entire Bible. God has blessed me to read it countless times. And so I know, as a matter of fact, that God's word, all of it can be trusted. OK, so so now let's go. So that's in uh, verses uh, one through four. So other than that, I agree with Titus verses one through four. In general, it makes sense. It uh, makes sense. And so the NIV translate that very well. So so now let's go to verse five where he tells uh, Titus, I left thee in Crete that thou should have set in orders the things that are wanting and ordain elders in every city. And so elders today, a lot of people today. People in the religious world and Christianity, a lot of people appoint themselves or anoint or ordain themselves as elders. And according to the Bible, the church members of that congregation, they are responsible, the church leaders and the members, they are responsible for ordaining an elder. No one could just be elder with God's approval, just doing it however they want. Okay, this is why we have the Holy Bible so we can follow it. This is why God wrote the Holy Bible and gave it to us. So these are specific instructions. A lot of it is very specific. And so but that's what we see in the world today. We see people anointing, appointing themselves or ordaining themselves as elders or pastors or bishops. And they don't have the they, you can't do this. You have to. The church has to be a part of that. The church leaders, the other church leaders in the church, they are responsible just like this. We, we see it here. OK, so. And we all want to participate in the process. The whole congregation is responsible to participate in that process. Okay, verse six. If any be blameless, the husband of one wife having faithful children, not accused of right or unruly. So he's saying be blameless as we keep reading. It's going to tell us what blameless is in general. The husband of one wife. So this is a person that's not divorced. He's been married one time and he has faithful children. 
not accused of right or unruly. So I'm assuming faithful children in the church. In my mind, I'm just speaking in general. I don't see how a two, three or four year old can be faithful. So I'm guessing he has to have children that's probably in middle school or teenagers. Because how else are we going to know if they're faithful? And so it must be a person that has children that's kind of grown up a little bit. Also, uh, I see some churches where they they anoint people or ordain elders and they're teenagers or they're young people in their 20s that's not even married. This is what's a lot of what's going on in the religious world today. The Christianity as far as Christianity go. And that's not good. And so this type of. When people take the Bible lukewarm or frivolous, this is what happens and it gives Christianity a bad name. Doesn't matter what church we go to. People that don't go to church at all don't have a church home. They see they just group it all together. They lump it all together. They don't know any better. And so they just see the the church, the Christianity, just, you know, just people just doing whatever they want to do and not adhering to the word of God. And that's not good. So, and as we can see, Paul kind of talks about this as we continue, as we read down earlier here in uh, Titus. And so his children, so he has to have faithful children who are well behaved. And we we won't know that. You can't know if a child, if a child is well behaved, that there's only one, if they're a baby. Okay, so we kind of, we have to use discretion, common sense. Which I heard someone say common sense ain't too common. And so so we have to use common sense and discretion when we're when we're when we're reading the word of God. God is God gave us a brain, so he expects us to have some kind of common sense when we're reading his word. And so excuse me, of course we need help with the Holy with the Holy Spirit to guide us, but at the same time, some things we just should know. God expects us to just know automatically we should be able to use common sense. Okay, so and remember, I'm speaking in general. There could be if and or buts to some of this stuff that I'm saying, and so I'm speaking in general. I can't. I'm not answering every question or every whatever person may have. You know, a contradiction or whatever a person may have. So I'm speaking in general. And so, if you have any questions or anything, don't hesitate to let me know. Email me Terry Temple Seven at Gmail. Let me know, and I'll address it at the next uh, podcast. Okay. So I have to do that. That's a part of being a Bible class teacher. We have to ask que- answer questions. I mean, we have to. With the word of God. Okay. So verse seven for a bishop must be blameless. As the steward of God. So now he's finna explain what blameless mean. And I don't think this excludes someone that maybe has a a extensive criminal record. For instance, something like sexual assault child molestation it doesn't say that here but we have to like i was saying we have to use wisdom and discretion and to assume that that's not included okay when he says blameless it's not going to mention it here but we have we do well to assume that he's including that those type of things okay so for a bishop bishop and elder the same thing must be blameless as the steward of god a servant of god not self will that means that he he does what the bible says not 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 his own opinions his own ideas he respects god's word not soon angry which means he doesn't have a quick temper not given to wine this means he's not a drinker he don't care for drinking some people don't care for drinking it's just something that they don't ever really think about doing Unless someone brings it up to them and even then they're like, no, I'm good. And they've just some people have never, ever tasted wine or maybe only one time or alcohol. And keep him. He's not just talking about wine. He's talking about alcoholic beverages. And so I did a little study on alcohol and where it came from. And so wine was one of the first alcohols that was created. Okay, and so today we have it's called distilled alcohol where basically is concentrated alcohol is fermented extra fermented alcohol or whatever they make it out of whether it's grains corn barley whatever and they add like yeast to it to make it stronger and so even though it says not given to wine it really means just any type of alcohol he's not a drinker 
some people don't care for smoking like me. I just, I'm just not a smoker. Never really been, you know. And so, uh, this, some people just don't care for smoking. And some people just ain't a drinker. This is what he's talking about. This is the type of person that qualifies as an elder. This is what he's saying. No striker. This means he's not violent. He's not a wife beater. I've seen church pre preachers. And I'm talking in general. I'm not picking on one church. I'm just saying in general. I've seen preachers in churches that beat their wives. Matter of fact, I saw not. I uh, said so maybe about a year ago. Some guy. Some guy professed to be a Christian. I don't know if he called himself an apostle or something. He literally killed his wife. She left him, I think, because he was beating on her and uh, she was leaving him and he went to her job and he uh, shot the lady, killed her on her job. She was she worked in a bank. He killed her. So but he, he would call himself being a bishop. That's what I'm saying. These people, they be ordaining themselves. <laughs> no, the church, the actual church members are the ones and the leaders. Not given to filthy lucre. This means that he he serves God, not mammon. Jesus said we can't serve God and mammon. He said we will hate one or love the other or and love the other. And so that's what filthy lucre is. It's like a person that's overly ambitious. There's nothing wrong with ambition. But if we're ambitious in the wrong direction, that's not good. The best ambition is for the kingdom of God and helping to build up God's kingdom. And building up God's kingdom, that we can do that through serving, through donating, monies, just things the church need. Just being there for the church, encouraging, praying for the church. All that, that includes building up the church. That's what God wants us to do as uh, Christians and godly women. So not giving to filthy lucre. He's not money hungry. He's not, oh, get rich at all costs. We see a lot of people in the religious world today. When I say religious world, I'm talking about Christianity in general. We see a lot of people in the religious world today and they are money hungry. There's nothing they won't do. They're people pleasers. They tell people what they want to hear. And and they also don't tell people what the Bible say because they know like, just like what I'm reading here. They won't teach this. Because they don't want to offend nobody in the church and run people off. Because they know people not living right. <laughs> okay, so I'm speaking in general. There's a lot of uh, good going on in the religious world. So I'm speaking in general. Verse 8, but a lover of hospitality. And so I think a lot of church leaders today, there just needs to be more hospitality where we get invited over to the elders' house, the church leaders' homes. So I think that's what it's talking about. We see a lot of people chatting in the parking lot, but we never go to these people's homes. That's not good. That's how you get to know a person when you go to their homes. Okay, so hosp being hospitable, that's a blessing to be hospitable. A lover of good men. Everybody don't love good people or godly people. And sober, that's back to the not drinking. And so it says sober, so I um, guess sober minded. You know, having a sober outlook, but it could also mean, you know, there's other ways to get high to not be sober. It could be smoking funny cigarettes or blunts, things like that. And so he has to be sober, not on drugs, just which would mean fair. It also means he's a fair person. He's not showing favoritism. I've seen elders uh, show favoritism. I mean, I, I remember one, one, the last congregation I worship at or was a member at the, I think we had like eight elders. I remember one of those elders not even shaking my hands. I'm like, how's he an elder? He won't even shake my hands. I'm the type of person everybody like. You either like me or hate me. That's the type of person I am. And if you hate me, it's only because I'm a child of God. And I try to do what's right and stick with the Bible and just very loving and friendly in general. Praise the Lord. Okay, so yeah, so he has to be fair. Favoritism is a sin. We see cliques in the church, sometimes even among the church leaders. That's not good. They're setting a very bad example when they do that. And churches like that have a lot of division. They don't last long. And when they do it, it's not really a nice place. It's not a, a, a place where people really want to hang out or worship on a regular basis. They may go to the worship service and that's it. But that's because there's cliques and, and stuff like that. That's not good. He must be holy. We learn about holiness all throughout the Bible. Being sober is holy. Not striking your wife is ho is holy. 
uh, not having a bad temper is holy. All this stuff is, is part of, of holiness and being faithful is holy and just basically doing what the Bible say do. That's being holy. And holy doesn't mean we never sin. It means when we do sin, we quickly repent of it. We don't walk in sin or waddle in sin. Temperament, that means he he's not a drinker once again. And he's uh he's stable. He he's not moody. And he has discipline and self-control. Okay, and verse, uh, let's see, the King James says, 8, it says, He must be hospitable, one who loves what is good, who is self-control, upright, holy, and disciplined. Yeah, so that means discipline, a person that has a lot of control over their self. And a lot of these, these, these qualifications, they're fruit of the Spirit. They are byproducts of a person who's been guided, who has the Holy Spirit, and being guided by the Holy Spirit. Verse 9, holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. And so he does, that means that if someone comes up to him and, and tries to tell him that, okay, what you said wasn't true, I don't believe that's Bible, he needs to be able to defend the truth with book, chapter, and verse. This is what he's, the Bible is saying right here, and that he should defend it and want to defend it and not back off the truth. But stick, you know, show the person that what the Bible says and says, this is it right here. Not be a coward and walk away when someone brings false teaching to him or have a miscorrect understanding, not not being a people pleaser. That's what it means. It's, it's, it's nothing wrong with being a people person. It means you love people, but a people pleaser as a child of God, especially a Bible class teacher, a preacher, or elder, that's not good. And so elders are also called to teach. And so I will read that. I got to go over to the book. We got to go over to the book of Timothy. I'm going to read that right fast. Okay. So, okay. So verse, so we're going to come back to verse 10, but right now let's go over to, let's go over, turn with me in your Bibles. Let's go over to the book of Timothy. So I'm going to show you in book of Timothy because Timothy also, it's in first Timothy chapter three. It also discusses the qualifications of a bishop or elder. So let's just read this right fast. Okay, so 1 Timothy chapter 3, it reads, This is a true, I'm reading the King James. This is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desire a good work. A bishop then must be blameless. He's covering what he already said in Titus. The husband of one wife, there's the one wife again. Vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach. So here I notice is notice it says to teach, apt to teach, where before it didn't, it didn't mention teaching. Okay, in verse three, not given to wine, no striker, not greedy, a filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous. So I mean he he he's patient, he's long suffering with people. He's kind and loving. He doesn't cause fights or trouble. He's not a troublemaker, not covetous, which means he doesn't have a lust, lust problem. He doesn't have this pride of life. Okay, he's not, he's not, uh, he's not materialistic. Verse 4, one that ruleth well his house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. And so and then verse five says, for if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? And so this goes together with the husband of one wife, because a man that runs his house well in general, he's not divorced and remarried. And so being divorced is a sign in general that a person doesn't know how to run their house well. So let's keep that in mind right there. Okay, and so verse 6, he's not a novice, which means he's not young. Like I was saying, you see some elders in some denominations, they're not even 30 years old and they're not married and don't have any children. And so it's like, okay, so he's not a novice. He's not a new convert. He's not a new Christian. I've seen churches in their eagerness and their overzealous to get an elder or deacons. They pick these people that's only been in the church a year and they're barely, they don't, you don't even know the person. A year is really not a long enough time to gauge a person. So let's keep reading. So verse six, not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. 
Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without. So that means even people that's not in the church. So outside of his family, outside the church family, just people in the world, they have, he has a good reputation. They got something good to say about him. And I think that kind of goes with what I was saying earlier about, about them, uh, being, uh, when it was talking about blameless, when I was saying they're not, a, a, a ever committed crimes like sexual assault or child molestation. It's kind of what I was, you know, what he's saying right here. Lest he fall into real approach in the snare of the devil. In verse 8, likewise, he mu likewise must the deacons be grave. So now he's talking about the deacons. At first he said bishop. And so likewise must the deacons be grave, not double tongue, not giving too much wine, not greedy of filthy lucre, holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. And and let these also first be proved. Then let them be let them use the office of a deacon being found blameless. And so he's saying the deacons, they have to be tested for a while. I'm guessing it's about 12 months. Okay, and so then verse eleven, even so must their even so must their wives be grave, not slanderous, sober, faith, sober, faithful in all things is verse eleven. And so the elders and the deacons, their wives, in order for them to qualify as an elder, to be ordained as an elder, their wives must must not be slanderous they must also be sober and faithful in all things the niv says in the same way the women are to be worthy of respect not malicious talkers but temperate and trustworthy in everything and so i've seen places where elders their wives it's like wow they're gossiping they're not kind they're snooty they're uh show a lot of favoritism and this is not good because when our leaders do this, this is going to carry over to the church, to the regular members. They're going to be snooty and show favoritism. And so this starts at the top. This is why God is giving this. He's saying if we want the congregations for the people to live in a righteous, upright manner, loving manner, the leaders have to do it. It trickles down. Okay. And so, um, uh, then verse 12, let the deacons be the husbands of one wife, ruling their children and their own house as well. And so, like I said before, a, di a divorced person having a divorce is an indication. Being divorced in general is an indication that they don't know how to run their house as well. I'm speaking in general. I know it takes two to get a divorce in general, but yeah, especially coming from the man's side, if it's his, if his fault. So, but I'm speaking in general, I understand that any spouse could just run up and leave the other spouse behind with basically no excuse. So I'm speaking in general. Okay. And so, uh, verse 13, for they that have used the office of a deacon, well, purchase it, pur for they that have used the office of a deacon, well, purchase to themselves a good degree and great boldness in the faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Okay, verse 13, the NIV says, those who have served well gain an excellent standing and great assurance in their faith in Christ Jesus. So I just wanted to cover that because it also, you know, it goes to connection. The Bible helps it. We learn the Bible by reading the Bible. And when we have a question, we answer the question with more scripture. Otherwise, we're using our own opinion. And of course, we have to use wisdom and discretion at the same time. And when when we're being faithful to God and our heart is right, he'll he'll open our eyes to the truth. OK, so I left off over here back into the book of Titus, King James. I left off at verse 10 and the NIV is just talks about rebuking those who fail to do good. And so I don't see a lot of rebuking of leadership in the church today. And this is not good. In the religious world today, I don't see a lot of rebuking of the leaders. And I think this is this is making Christianity look worse, you know, or look bad. Because Christianity overall by itself, what Jesus did, Jesus left us perfect. When he left us, when he built his church, he left everything perfect. But you have mankind, like Paul is talking about right here, they come in there and mess up. And so there's not a lot of rebuking and disciplining and disfellowship of church leaders. There's a lot of passing the buck. 
And so that's not good. It's messing up the church as a whole. Or it's messing up Christianity, I mean, as a whole overall. And that's not good. Remember, we're in the last days. These letters was written about 2,000 years ago. And so things have gotten worse since then. So let's try to keep that part in mind. Okay, verse 10. For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision. So who is he talking about the circumcision? Who is this? It's the Jews. Remember the Jews, they had to circumcise their son on day eight. And so, so what Jews were doing, they were going around telling Christians, this is, this is evidence in the book of Acts. I can't remember exactly where, but it's in Acts. The Jews, the Jewish Christians, they were going around telling people in order to be a Christian, they first had to be circumcised. And so they did not want to let go of the old law. The laws and everything under Moses and in the Old Testament, they did not want to let go of that. And so they were causing trouble. And this is what Paul is addressing right here. He also addresses this a lot in the New Testament in the letters that he wrote from the book of Romans, uh, Romans, Corinthians, Hebrews, I think Galatians, Ephesians. He's constantly talking or refuting the Jewish Christians. Because a lot of them, not all of them, but a lot of them, they kept trying to get the new Christians to obey the the Jewish customs or the Jewish commands, such as one of them was keeping the Sabbath. And they had a bunch of festivals and celebrations and things that they did in the Old Testament that they didn't. We don't we don't today. We don't have to keep. And this is Paul is refuting this. And so even today in the religious world, this is a pet peeve of mine. And I'm sure Paul's too. This is what he's why he keeps talking about it. So even today in the religious world, there's a lot of uh, teachers, preachers, elders, people in the church or profess to be in Christians. They are telling people things of the Old Testament that we have to follow or they're practicing the worship services and some of the doctrine and stuff in the Old Testament they're bringing over to the New Testament without God or Jesus's permission. One of them is tithing. We don't have to tithe today in the New Testament. We are commanded to give as we prosper. But we don't have to tithe. Tithing is a whole system. Tithing is huge. It's not just, oh, here, just tithe your tithe. No, it's a whole system. If you don't know a lot about tithing, I encourage you to study tithing and how to originate and everything. But it's a whole sermon on that. It's a whole big lesson on tithing and on why the Jews and everything uh, had to tithe. Okay, so that's what the Jewish that's what the Jewish leaders were doing. Some of the Jewish Christian leaders, the ones that they had obeyed the gospel, but they had a difficult time letting go of the old law. And so it bothers me even today where I hear and see preachers or Bible class teachers. They stay in the Old Testament. It's like, can you get out of the Old Testament? We are under the New Testament today. The New Testament of Jesus Christ and what he told the apostles to teach us, which is known as the Apostles Doctrine, which begins in the book of Acts all the way down to Jude. That's that's the law that we're under today. Everything that God wanted us to obey in Old Testament, he transferred over to the new and we should be able to read it and we will be able to read it in the New Testament if it applies to us. If it don't, we're not going to read about it. And so verse 11, he says, whose mouths must be stopped. This is what he's talking about. He's saying who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. He's saying they just doing this to get rich, just to, to pad their pocketbooks. This is what he's saying. We see a lot of this today in the religious world, in these denominations and even non-denominations. It's just even in the Lord's church, there's just people just want to get rich. They want to be entertained from the leaders, even some of the members. We see a lot of this happening. Remember, I said we're in the last days. And so as time goes on, things is gonna things gonna get worse. But thank God he's in charge. Jesus in charge. So that we don't have to worry or fret. We just have to do our part and stay faithful and encourage our family member and other church members to stay faithful to keep the faith. 
Okay, so verse 12, he says, one of them, one of themselves, even a prophet of their own says, Christians are always liars, evil beasts, slow bellies. Man, he called them evil beasts. Verse 13, this witness is true. So he's confirming it is true. Where, wherefore, rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith. Like I was saying, there's not a lot of rebuking. I can't remember last time I saw a church leader or anyone disfellowship, especially properly. It's very rare. And I've even asked people in some of my groups on Facebook, when last time you saw a church member discipline or disfellowship? And barely no one, no one can remember. And so the church is not doing their duty. And so this is one reason a lot of this trouble, the wolves and sheep clothing that Paul warned us about is so prevalent in the religious world today. Verse 14, not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men that turn from the truth. And so that's what he's saying, Jewish fables. And so that's all this stuff that come from the Old Testament that they're trying to carry over. One of them is that the Jews are God's chosen people, not anymore. Anyone that's a Christian, Christians are God's chosen people. Those who obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ, baptized believers who repented of their sins, con confess Jesus and who are staying faithful. That's God's chosen people or those in the church. That's God's chosen people, not Jews. And so that's some of the Jewish fables is what they're teaching. Got to be circumcised. Still got to go to a worship service on the Sabbath. They probably was trying to make them worship on the Sabbath and Sunday. The Lord's Day. That's probably what they was trying to do. Just think, just getting an educated guess. That's probably what they were doing. Okay. And then trying to keep, make them keep the other. They had like moon celebrations. Oh, they just did a whole bunch of, they had a lot of worship practices in the Old Testament. And they were probably just trying to cling on to that, to hold on to that. And we don't have to do that today. We're under the law of liberty. We're under God's grace and mercy. We're not under that. There's no stoning. When we sin, nobody's getting stoned. We're not under that today. And I know a lot of people don't know it. They don't understand. That's why it's important to listen to my last podcast where I talk about how briefly how we uh, write, how we should rightly divide the word of God and how it should be uh, divided. So uh, as to reduce the confusion in the religious world, especially in our lives, if nothing else. So verse 15, unto the pure, all things are pure, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure, but even their mind and conscience is defiled. And so if we keep reading down verse 16, we'll answer what is he's talking about. So verse 16 says, they profess that they know God, but in works they deny him, being abominable and disobedient and unto every good work reprobate. That's what Paul said, not me. He said reprobate. And the NIV says they are detestable, disobedient, unfit for doing anything good. Wow, that's deep. They ain't playing. They're not playing and they stepping on toes and they don't care. And if you get if people get offended, it's like, oh, well, but this is why, like I was saying, not us listening, but people in general, they don't like the Bible and that's not good. And so we see a lot of this today in the religious world. They profess that they know God, but in works, they deny him. Being abominable, which means they're doing some great sins. Abomination, that just means huge, great. So that means they're sinning greatly. They're disobedient. It's just not, they're not faithful to the word of God. He's talking about people that say they know God. This is what they're doing. And into every good work reprobate, it's like, wow. So I ain't really, really sure what he means there, but that's pretty deep. That's pretty deep. I'm sure we keep reading the word. I think Romans chapter one, uh, covers a lot of what he's talking about so let's read romans let's read that romans chapter one i think that's where it is that i hope i'm all right let me see romans chapter one so romans chapter one verses 18 and i'll just read the niv and it's uh, titled God's Wrath Against Sinful Humanity. This is what's going on today. And just remember, this was written 2,000 years ago and things have gotten a little worse. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all of the godliness, godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Since what may be known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world. God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. Verse 21. 
For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him. But their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like a mortal human being and birds and animals and reptiles. Therefore, God, therefore God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served created things rather than the creator who is forever praised. Amen. Because of this, God gave them over to a shameful lust. Even their women exchanged natural sexual relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, the men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed shameful acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for their er error. Verse 28. Furthermore, just as they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, so God gave them over to a depraved mind so that they do what ought not to be done. They have become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. They are gossip, slanders, God haters, insolent, arrogant, and boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their disobey their parents they have no understanding no fidelity no love no mercy although they know God's righteous decree that they who do such things deserve death they not only continue to do these very things but also approve of those who practice them wow that's deep and so this is he's talking about the world in general but then he says those who even know better are still you know, doing things they shouldn't be doing. And so that's kind of what Titus is talking about when he says they profess to know God, but in works they deny him being abominable. That's great sins and disobedient unto every good work reprobate. That's King James Version. Okay, so that's the study of the book of Titus chapter one. So next week we're going to go into chapter two. And so that's mainly going to be talking about the women. The older women in the church in our duty. I did a video on this too. I'll try to put it in my group on Facebook. Maybe link it in my newsletter. Lord's will. Okay, so if, like I said, if you all have any questions or anything, let me know. Email me and, uh, and I'll answer it. I'll address it in the next one. Okay, that's what I'm here for. I'm here to answer the questions. Okay, and so like I said, I'm speaking in general. So I know someone might be saying, but, but what if, but so sometimes, you know, there are some, well, many times there's what in, what if and but. And so we have to address those. And so that's my job is when I study something, I should know what I'm talking about. And I should be, if I don't know the answer, I, should, I will at least and should be able to find an answer. And that's what I'm going to do. That's what I'll try to do and going to do. Okay, so let me know. So let's close out with a prayer. Let's close out to God, Holy Father, with a prayer. Holy Father, God, who are in heaven, Lord, thank you once again for this opportunity to study your word. Lord, it's been a blessing. Give us the courage, wisdom, desire, and strength to apply what we have learned. Uh, to apply it to our lives. Guide us today. Direct ourselves. Put your armor protection around us and our loved ones. And bless the church all over the world. Pray it will be done. Direct our steps. And uh, thank you for being so good to us. Thank you for your abundant blessings in our lives. We love you and need you. And we thank you for listening to us and answering this prayer. We know it's not in vain. In Jesus name. Amen. And so another thing I just want to say right quick before I go. These uh, qualifications for the bishop and stuff. We want to encourage our family members. And church members to to seek the position of a bishop because these things are possible. God has created people like this in the church. He's he's created uh, elders and deacons. They just have to be uh, uh, or they have to come forward or we should know them uh, by their uh, works and character and traits we should know these people and we want to encourage them because they are out there it's not impossible for a person to meet these qualifications otherwise God wouldn't have put it here in the Bible so they're there they're at churches and so I want to encourage you to encourage your family members or other church members to seek the position of an elder or a deacon and other leadership positions in the church that build up the church such as a preacher Bible class teacher even women teachers women Bible class teachers 
teaches to teach the other women and the younger children or the children, teenagers, on and on. Okay, so I want to encourage you to do that and that this is possible. And that's why God wrote it, because it's possible and it's beautiful. And that's the way the church should be run. When I see churches where you have a person... And today we see in some churches in a religious world where the preacher, he calls himself a bishop. He's ordained himself and he's running the show. He's doing it all by himself. He's wearing himself out. The best type, the best type of congregation to worship at is one with elders and deacons. I've been to both. I've been to churches where one preacher tries to run everything and I've been where they had elders and deacons and it's just more organized and their leader. Uh, he's more blessed. The leadership is more blessed because he's not trying to do everything on his own. When he, we, ha we see these congregations where the preacher slash bishop is trying to do everything on his own, he's, he's wearing himself out. That's not God's plan. That's not God's will. There is no hierarchy like that in the church. The hierarchy is the elders, deacons, preachers, teachers, evangelists. Like that. And so there's no one man show. That's what I'm trying to say. Just, there's no monopoly. There's no one person supposed to run a congregation. This is why God says we should ordain or God has given elders and deacons and preachers and evangelists and stuff because it's not, it's not supposed to be a one man show as we see so much in the religious world today. And so this is why we see a bunch of false teaching and stuff in the church because we're not adhering, not us, but the leaders, they're not adhering to the word of God. And so they're just doing what they, someone told them, you know, that they could do and they just run out and do it. And so to be an evangelist, to spread the word of God, we don't need God's permission to, I mean, we don't, I mean, say God permission. We don't need anyone's permission. We don't need to be ordained to spread the word of God, to teach a Bible class to someone. We don't have to be ordained. That's a commandment for everyone. We don't have to be ordained to do that. But the elders, they are to be ordained by the congregation as we just read. And so we see a lot of shortcomings and failures and, and Christianity being given a bad name, which we'll read in, in uh, chapter two. This is why Christianity is being given a bad name. A lot of people just don't want to go to church because they just see it's a big mess. And it is because mankind is not listening. People who profess to be Christians and all this, a lot of them, they're not, they don't have no reverence and fear of God. Or a lot of them just being misled and mistaught misinformed and they don't even really know you know what's going on they're just doing what somebody told them to do not checking with the bible and that's why it's so important to study the bible for ourselves and so so yes yeah, the last note like i said just encourage i'm just hoping you encourage someone in your family you know in the church family where you worship to be uh to consider being a bishop or elder or deacon in the church okay because it is a it is an honor it's a privilege Okay, so I don't qualify me and my husband like the parent. We I don't have the gift of parenting to be a bishop's wife. And my husband doesn't either. We have one son and he drives us crazy. And so <laughs> we don't have the gift of parenting. These people, the bishops, they have the gift of parenting. This is why they're able to run their households well. It's a gift from God. All of these things are gifts from God. It's nothing we can pat ourselves on the back for because God works through people. So we can't take credit for nothing. God is all he's all knowing and he does it and God is great and God is love and he loves us and so just you know I just want to encourage you that God be with you the rest of the week God is with you he cares about you God loves you he wants the best for you and when we stay faithful and even just ask God to give us the strength to stay faithful he will when we ask him all we have to do is ask that's all we got to do in uh, the book of James, he said, we have not because we ask not. And so whatever you need, just ask God. And if you need prayers or anything, email me. Let me know, TerryTemple7 at gmail. Visit my website, TerryTemple.org. And let me know if you have any questions or comments or anything. I'm here for you. This is uh, my women's ministry, and it's a labor of love here in the kingdom of God. And so I hope you enjoyed this podcast today. May God, our Holy Father in heaven, continue to bless you so that you may always, always, always be a blessing wherever you go. Chat with you later. Bye-bye.